For a very, and I mean very long time, horse games have been suffering through the same old, same old games with the exact same themes and gameplay. Windstorm Legend of Kimori, or Kimori as I will be referring to it for this video, is a breath of fresh air in an otherwise stale genre. Being developed by Esser Interactive, the game aims to break new ground for horse games in general, foregoing the usual English or Western riding competitions to save your ranch and instead focusing on history with a flair of mysticism. And of course, horses. Lots and lots of horses. However, despite these interesting ideas, I am a little concerned for Kimori. A little for some of the features they're promising and a lot for their track record for horse games in general. It's not great. This video will be an overview of Kimori, my thoughts on the features and concepts and of course, a quick touch on the drama that happened a few weeks ago because we can't have a horse game without some good old drama, can we? But before we get into all of that, I'd like to thank my Ko-Fi supporters for being more awesome than a plague horse in Star Stable Online. They do have the medieval theme, it's almost Halloween, it would have been awesome. I'm just saying, let's get into it. Windstorm Legend of Kimori is set in the world of Windstorm, which is, and I quote, a series of movies, books, and games centered around the eponymous Black Stallion and his friend and rider, a young girl called Mika. Previously, the stories around Windstorm across media have primarily taken place around the Kaltenbach estate in modern-day Germany. They go on to say, The Windstorm stories are all about freedom, friendship, and fairness and how we treat our four-legged companions, not about fame or glory. Trying to capture this element, they decided to head back to the root of its origin, Mongolian culture and history. In this world, they have a term known as Norsdish, the sleeper, which is a sort of Mongolian horse whisperer. And we, of course, will be playing as such a person. We are also a courier, so our goal is to travel the great steps to deliver packages. Kind of like a death stranding without the death goop or truck simulator without the road rage. The gameplay will consist of planning your routes over terrain and through weather, riding, breeding horses, collecting materials, crafting some archery puzzles and just enjoying the scenery. There won't be any combat in the game and overall it seems like Kimori is aiming for a more cozy style game, much like in the same vein as Palia or Ranch of Rivershine, which have both proven that combat is not always a necessity to make games successful. But the problem is that they themselves refer to the game as an action-adventure game, which brings to mind a very specific type of game. Tomb Raider, Uncharted, God of War, Batman Arkham series, Red Dead Redemption, Star Wars Fallen Jedi are all considered action-adventure games. And what you will note is that they all have combat. So, although I am absolutely not against the idea of having a chill game about horses, calling it an action-adventure game when there won't be any combat or action is a little disingenuous and could be a little problematic, especially if people expect a certain type of game. I would perhaps call it cozy adventure, which seems to be more in line with what they're going for, as shown by the concepts for the gameplay. Speaking of which, let's get into the gameplay. Now for this section, I am going to use their older games as a springboard to discuss what the game could be and potentially the pitfalls they might stumble into from these older titles. And we're going to start with the horses. The horses in Kimori will be quite versatile with a lot of personalities, possibly unique abilities, preferences and of course breeds. Each horse will have five basic stats, strength, agility, speed, endurance and balance. And I quote, these values affect how the horse's movement works as well as how well it can carry the cargo from courier missions. In addition, every horse is born, bought or tamed with a certain potential, which can be invested through training into the aforementioned stats." End quote. Their first Winston game, Start of a Great Friendship, also had these particular stats. Each of these stats affected the horse's movement and ability and made it easier to control the horse as time went on. After gaining a level, you could distribute a point into one of these stats, boosting that ability. I quite like this feature as it feels more like a role-playing game and gives weight to the training. Now, the potential stat they mention has been seen in horse games before. It's really nothing new, but the most recent and most alike would be Ranch of Rivershine, where a distinct potential bar is slowly depleted and then shared into the different abilities. This is not the only point where Kimori took inspiration from Ranch of Rivershine, but I'll get into that a little bit later. The personalities for the horses have not been expanded on greatly, but we are aware of one key aspect. They will have preferences of terrain. And I quote, Similarly, similarly, similar fucking literally, I hate this word. 
I hate this word. An enemy. I can say an enemy. I can't say similarly. <laughs> S- similarly. I got it. S- sim- similar. So fucking I hate this word. Similarly, horses can be trained and they also have personality traits. They may favor one type of terrain or another, meaning the player can make additional choices about whether to actively seek out or to avoid patches of sand, gravel or mud, which then influence their travel speed and efficiency. For this, we have to look no further than their newest horse game, Horse Tales Emerald Valley Ranch, which came out in 2022. Which is an interesting game, to be sure. Go watch my video. In this game, horses had different personalities, or rather likes and dislikes. This included their treats, which you could only figure out through trial and error, spots to scratch, which you could only figure out through trial and error, and terrain, which really had very little effect on anything and made no damn sense. Essentially, you had horses that would prefer running over sand or through forests, and when they ran over this specific terrain, they would be faster. Oof. They continue to say, those ground types may be further influenced by weather, adding another layer of possible consideration when picking an optimal route in Kimori. To keep the game accessible and not overcomplicate things for less experienced players, these path optimizations are optional. Roads serve as an alternative that all horses can use in every weather condition, they just might not be the fastest option. And they sort of describe the problem in their own post. If there is going to be weather and the wilderness will be more difficult to traverse if it's wet and muddy, wouldn't it then be better to just stay on the road because you will be more than likely slowed down in the weather if you are in the wilderness? You are a courier, you're supposed to be going fast. And no matter how you spin it, a road will always be faster. Furthermore, and just to be a little bit more nitpicky, horses are living creatures, and as little as a human likes to run through mud or over sand, so too will a horse not enjoy doing so because you lose a lot more stamina over these terrains than you do on flat, even ground. No endurance rider in their right mind would ride a horse deliberately over loose sand if they can avoid it. It would tire the horse out too quickly and would slow them down considerably, and then their time would be completely fucked and you will see a grumpy endurance rider, which looks exactly like all the other endurance riders because they all have a resting face of I am dying. Even the Pony Express in America had specific cross-country routes that riders had to take to deliver their parcels. I'll get into the details of these expresses in a bit, but the point here is that they didn't plan routes through the outback. They had a specific road to ride. Because if you know the route you're riding, you're going to know where it's safe to gallop and where it's better to slow down. And if you get caught in the rain that will slow you down, it won't bring you to a standstill as you are not in unfamiliar territory. In the case of the Mongolian Pony Express or Yam system, they instead used the silk roads as their routes because flat, even roads will always be faster than going through the swamp and safer. Now, I want to make this clear. The problem isn't that the horses have preferences in terrain. I think that's a cute concept, and having a horse be happy to splash through mud or run through a field is very cute and endearing, but it just doesn't make a lot of sense if you're going to deliver parcels fast. If it's all about speed, then just put your ears back and go. And that's the other thing. The game talks about speed and delivering fast, but at the same time, they are calling it cozy. It feels like a sort of contradiction. I could be wrong, but I feel like these two concepts aren't aligning. But the point is, I like the idea of horses liking or disliking terrain. I'm just not too sure at this stage how gameplay will work, as it feels like not a lot of thought has really been put into how these Pony Express systems used to work or how traveling and terrain works in general. I think they need to chat to some endurance riders. Now, I challenge the entire dev team to get their butts at a beach and test how long and how far they can run, and then take those same butts to a field and time themselves and see which one was faster. Let me know if you do that. For the like or dislike of terrain, horse tails didn't do this properly either. With horses hating sand, but also loving sand, and randomizing not always randomizing properly, it could work. They just have to think about it really carefully and implement it properly this time. But all of this actually ties into training. Unlike a lot of horse games, training will not be a separate entity that can only be accessed via arenas, but will instead occur as you are riding your horse. And I quote, And what better way to make the traversal of steppe, forest and mountainside matter than to ensure that the movement itself is what trains your horses. Meaning you ride around and your horse gets better at 
riding around. For example, riding tight turns or winding around obstacles at a canter will train your horse's agility, while moving through knee-high water or over deep muddy ground will increase its strength. This can also mean that you might choose to stay on the road and preserve your horse's potential for future speed training rather than moving over ground that will train something else. This is exactly the same as Ranch of Rivershine. Rivershine is a game by Cozy Bee Games being developed by one person and they really figured out a stunning way to train horses. Where a lot of games tend to shove you into designated training areas, Rivershine allows you to train as you ride. It's a great system, but did showcase some issues with implementation. Essentially, you don't have a lot of control over the training. Much as with Kimori, Rivershine has a potential stat that slowly depletes and gets distributed between the other stats, depending on what you're training. When you canter, speed is trained, galloping endurance, turning trains flexibility, and jumping trains, well, jumping. The issue is that because you're riding your horse everywhere, you often just waste points in speed. This forces you to trot or constantly switch between gallop and canter to get different training in. Flexibility could at one point only be trained by putting a rock on your keyboard and letting the horse spin in circles for as long as possible. I'm not kidding, I used a dinosaur tail. Although it's realistic, it had some downsides. Now Rivershine has figured out how to fix these issues and I'm curious to see how Komori will approach it and overcome those problems because we are going to be constantly riding our horses and is it possible that we're just going to be riding over terrains that train the wrong stuff? It's, it's not impossible and it's exactly the same problem that Rivershine has. But I am glad that they took such intense inspiration from Rivershine. I hope more games will pick up what Cozy Bee Game is putting down, especially the damn auction house. The next point on the feature list is traveling and exploration. In the devlog they know Note, they want to keep the map diverse and interesting to ride through. Mongolia and the steppes is a pretty diverse and beautiful country, so they had no problem finding great inspiration for that alone. And really the world so far, although very much the same with fields and forests and forests and fields, does look beautiful. They continue on. Our game map is therefore planned to be quite sizable, even by AAA gaming standards, in order to give players the sense of having vast areas to explore and to suit the scale of the world to feel right when traversed at a horse's gallop rather than at a human's jog. And also, for the player there should be something happening roughly every 60 seconds of playtime. This something can be an NPC riding by, a swarm of birds soaring overhead, an interactable point of interest or a wild wolf howling. And quote. So, they have a very clear vision of what exactly needs to happen in this world to keep it interesting. However, from their past games, I honestly wonder if they will be able to pull this off. Windstorm, A Great Friendship, Ari's Arrival and Horse Tales all suffered from the exact same problem. They were extremely boring to explore. Now, boring is a very subjective term. It can also mean relaxing for some people, but there is a line. In Windstorm, A New Arrival, for example, the horse would keep up the canter pace eternally and would move out of the way of trees and obstacles automatically. This was a fine idea on paper and showed some pathfinding coding and made the horses feel alive but it essentially meant you could hit forward on the keyboard, get up, leave and come back later. I finished a book like this. Horse Tales in turn was very corridor driven, with the map often following along paths making the world feel claustrophobic and closed off. A Great Friendship also had exploration, but it was really just ride around and find stuff in the field. It was just something extra to do above the competitions. Overall, this company doesn't have a great track record for making the game world interesting to explore or fun to ride through. They usually end up becoming mindless rides through empty, vacant worlds. I still want to know what the apocalypse was. Now, they do mention Reddit Redemption 2 as inspiration, and that game did have the encounter mechanic which kept exploration interesting and diverse. You never knew what you were going to come across or who you were going to meet in your travels. If they can implement something like this, it should keep the game world fresh and interesting to explore. However, they mention only, and I quote, this something can be NPC riding by, a swarm of birds, an interactable point, or a wild wolf howling, end quote. And all of these are very passive events that make for good atmosphere, but will it alleviate the doldrum of riding from point A to point B, which is what this game will be at its core? This could be achieved through the archery mechanic. 
but it depends again on execution. Ari's arrival had archery, but again it was so simplistic and dull it barely counted as any sort of real challenge. It was just an activity to do while riding around. They are very good at making fun stuff dull, aren't they? However, they do mention arrows that have different effects, which reminded me of the Thief series. So there are ways to spruce up gameplay and it does sound like they are trying to fix the mistakes from older games. So it's a 50-50 at this point on how well they're going to execute this. Now the next thing I want to talk about is the breeding and this is where things got a little interesting. The horses have been an interesting contention point between developers and the players. A lot of people quite like the horses and find them charming and cute. A handful of people find the horse off-putting, saying they are quite ugly. And then we have a third group who say that the horses don't look like Mongolian horses. Let's start with the positives. Cute and charming, I sure as hell agree. I love Mongolian horses and seeing people enjoy them and appreciate them makes me happy. There seems to be a wide variety of coats and the developers have, more than likely thanks to the response from players, added more horse variety into the game to give players a choice. You can also crossbreed Mongolian horses now. I do have a thought on this. <clears throat> I'm very glad that they are taking the time to try and get the Mongolian horse as accurate as possible. That should be commended. I'm also happy that they are hearing feedback and trying to fix the animations. But adding Warmbloods is very bizarre. In this period, they had and very much utilized the Mongolian pony or horse. These animals are tough little buggers with extreme endurance, wild spirits and deep loyalty. And people, I feel, just don't have an appreciation for them. Thanks to Arabians, Frisians, Andalusians, Marwaris and all other array of horse breeds, the Mongolian horse has been been classified as ugly. They have stocky necks, short legs, long bodies and big heads and horsey people who like aesthetics just don't like these horses. As a result, players were sort of upset by how the Mongolian horse looked. I have to admit that this was mostly people who were talking to me and not as much the comments because I went through all the videos and I couldn't find the damn comments. So I'm just gonna say trust me bro. When the new promotional material landed, the developers had added the Mongolian mixes and warm bloods and this is where the problem is. It comes across like the Mongolian horse isn't good enough, so let's add horses that people will actually like. And isn't this a bit insulting to the culture of Mongolia, whose entire history was literally written and carved out on the back of these horses? And I want to make it clear, I'm actually not blaming the developers on this one. At the end of the day, they have to sell a game. I blame the people who complained about the ugly horses. And now we have warm bloods, which technically didn't even exist then, because warm bloods are essentially cold blood and hot blood horses crossbred to create the quote unquote ideal horse. And the Holsteiner was the only warm blood in the 13th century, and they were all the way in Germany. So what is the warm blood doing all the way here in Mongolia? And why is it screwing with the Mongolian horse bloodlines? Calm the fuck down! I blame the community for the stupidity and for not appreciating these horses for what they were, historically and culturally important to Mongolia. I'm probably freaking out over nothing and someone is going to tell me that I have no idea what I'm talking about. But fine, I just want people to appreciate the Mongolian horse and is, is that really so bad? A few years back I made a short video on Mongolian horses. If you want to learn more about them, you can check out the video here. I really love these horses and they really deserve a lot better from the equestrian community than what they are getting now. As for the inaccuracy to the horse, let's take a look. Mongolian horses have short legs, long bodies and thick necks with big heads. Looking at this model on the left, we can see a lot of the same attributes. The only point I'd say doesn't fit is the length of the body and another point is the size of the horse. Mongolian horses are pretty darn small horses, borderline pony, and making this big seems odd, but overall I think they tried to capture the essence of the Mongolian horse and I think they sort of succeeded. Just to point out, if you are going to say that Mongolian horses can be big because of these horses, I unfortunately have to tell you that a lot of the horses that are ridden in the Nadam are actually crossbred with thoroughbreds or other horses. This has become such a concern that they are now pushing for conservation in Mongolia to prevent the small horses from being bred out entirely. Which again just makes the crossbreeding in the game all the more terrible. But with that out of the way, the breeding does sound pretty cool. You will be able to select which attributes you want to keep from a breeding to prevent breeding the same two horses over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. The best part of horse breeding games. This is really a nice feature and shows that they did learn from horse tails, sort of. Horse tails had a fascinating breeding concept. You had to find resources to breed a horse. So in a sense, you were basically crafting foals. Oh, oh, sorry. 
I mean you were crafting horses, because you can only get the damn foal if you bought the DLC. What is wrong with this company? Point is, it didn't really feel like breeding. It felt 90% like running around finding resources and 10% of actually breeding and wondering how the poor mare felt squeezing out a full-sized horse. I hope they can make the breeding more user-friendly in the new game, as this was not and never will be fun. And please do not make the foals DLC. That would be lovely. But what they are definitely ejecting into hyperspace are the minigames. In Horse Tales, they had a lot of minigames to clean the horse, put the horse, pet the horse, bait the horse, whatever the horse. Those drove me up the damn walls, but they did promise they are avoiding this Fukimori, which is actually really damn awesome. Now we get to the part I'm most excited about. Historical accuracy. You thought I was gonna say drama, didn't you? Yeah, that's what you thought I was gonna say. Because that's what all you people ever care about is the drama. I'm staring at you judgmentally, but you can't see my face. A game does not have to be historically accurate. Absolutely not. Assassin's Creed, Ghost of Tsushima and even Kingdom Come Deliverance had to bend the rules of historical accuracy to ensure that their games could be enjoyed. With that being said, there are a few things people are all complaining about that make sense and a few that don't. Now the developers themselves set their game in the 13th century Mongolia. They also make it clear that the game will not be historically accurate. But this is still a very specific era with very specific things, specifically in Mongolia. But let's look at the smaller grievances first. The first and biggest one a lot of people complain about is the red hair for the main character. Although they are exceedingly rare, there are absolutely examples of Mongolian people who have red hair. So that is not a problem and does at least fit well with the culture and people. The second issue that people have raised is the clothing that our main character is wearing. And the questions is raised like, why does she have three sleeves? The clothing is stunning, with bright colors, a lot of layers and textures making it feel lively and striking, while at the same time making it seem traditional. The issue is to do with historical accuracy. According to quite a few comments, the clothing is very divorced from what 13th century clothing would have looked like back in the day, and represents a more the modern day clothing of the Mongolian people. Art depicts the type of clothing that they would have worn in that century, so if it's not in line with the art, it's probably not in line with history. And then we have the backpack. <laughs> the backpack is very modern. If we go back to the 15th century, art depicts backpacks as single strap crosses over the chest. Some used wooden backpacks and some simple linen. To be fair, the belt buckle had been invented and used since possibly the 6th century, and backpacks had been around the world for a very long time. So merging those two is not out of the realm of possibility, but it still stands out like a sore thumb and just enforces this idea that they are focusing on more modern Mongolia than 13th century. Finally, I will say these clothes are very impractical for a career's job. Wearing beads, like, is bound to get you strangled at some point as a horse rider? But it is a game and we have to leave some leeway here for developers to have some fun with the design, be creative, and just make it pretty, and no one can really say that this garb doesn't look pretty. But the question still remains, why do I have three sleeves? But all of these smaller problems really accumulate to a larger issue. Most of the game is very much divorced from 13th century Mongolia. And if that is the case, why are they setting it in 13th century Mongolia? The clothing isn't correct, the horses as we've established aren't that well done, and beyond that, nothing else from the century has been mentioned either, which is a damn shame, as arguably this century was one of the most important ones for Mongolian history. Here are some of the fun stuff that happened. For around the first 30 years of the 13th century, Genghis Khan was pillaging like it was going out of fashion. For those who might actually not know, Genghis Khan or Temujin was the founder for the Mongolian Empire, and he did so by beating the crap out of his neighbors and having a very open-door policy to religion. He would pass away in 1227, and this would begin the Pax Mongolica era. The Pax Mongolica, or Mongolian peace, started some time after Genghis Khan's death and would usher in an era of stability for Eurasia. This doesn't mean war stopped entirely, hell to the no. But the Mongolian Empire was stable, it wasn't wobbling. Now just to pause here briefly, seeing as the game is a cozy style game, the setting will more than likely take place after 1227 when the Silk Roads were open for commerce and would eventually lead to the deaths of millions as the Black Death happily traded along those routes as well in the 14th century. But during this time, the Yam system was more or less established. This was a postal service that Mongols ran throughout the empire, like an earlier Pony Express. And this is probably one of the most interesting aspects of the Mongolian Empire. The Yam was a way station for large buildings where up to 400 horses could be housed for the messengers to ride. 
The messengers in turn had luxurious rooms fit for a king, which were decorated in fine silk. Each of these yams were 25 and 45 miles apart and ensured that messages could be sent and received at a blistering pace. And when they say blistering, they damn well mean it. And I quote, they rode so intensely that they had to tie themselves to the horse with tight bands around their head, chest and stomachs to prevent themselves from falling off. At night, their speed would be reduced as a torch would have to be carried to guide the way. Nonetheless, accounts from that era say that a distance of 200 to 250 miles could be covered in a single day this way. In comparison to the game that we have, there is nothing of this. None of the thrill or fast-paced intensity these riders must have experienced. And again, this is fine. There's nothing wrong with making a cozy courier game. I like Lake. But this just feels like a missed opportunity, especially for the setting. Delivering messages to outposts or generals and exchanging horses en route to ensure they are rested before galloping off again, desperately trying to get there in time. And for those who would prefer a more relaxed style game, there could be a quote unquote no time penalty style game like the forest has a peaceful setting. Beyond this, we also had the Yuang dynasty. When Kublai Khan was on the throne and when China was ruled by the Mongol Empire, a wide range of cultures and people would meet and mingle on the now-established trade routes, and Mongolia was a melting pot of religions, ideals, and cultures, as I believe it is in a lot of ways today. Yes, the Mongols were very war-focused for a long time, but beyond that, they started and ruled one of the largest empires ever to be recorded, second only to the British Empire. And not a single part of this history has even been mentioned, touched, looked at or even brushed over by the developers. Nowhere in their posts has the empire been mentioned. Nowhere have they acknowledged the yam. Players are acknowledging the yam, but not the developers. So the issue I'm having with this setting is not its historical accuracy, it's the historical apathy, which I find even more egregious. But I will wait for the game to come out, because it might still surprise me, and it's only fair to give it a fair chance. But let's get into the drama. Yay. On the 23rd of September, Alice Rupert, the community manager for Legend of Kimori, made a tweet sharing the game and asking, would you play this? The tweet accumulated quite a lot of traction, then a random user made this comment. I would love to, as long as it can avoid woke DEI nonsense, which appears unlikely as you have pronouns in your bio, end quote. This was obviously a passive-aggressive comment, clearly someone trying to poke the bear and see what they got. And they got an interesting response. Alice replied, For every comment like this, I will add one extra pronoun to the game. This resulted in Rupert getting attacked and being called a slew of names for wanting to add unique pronouns to a historical setting. But anyone with sense could see that Rupert was not saying that she was going to add pronouns, but rather she was just being flippant and clapping back in her own way. And I quote, I thought I'd just try a quick post on my last day of work before vacation and whoopsied into a 3 million views viral tweet. And now people are arguing in my mentions about whether or not our game is going to be too woke. Skull emoji, skull emoji, skull emoji. And then she continues. I'ma fuck off on holiday and not check my notifications for at least two weeks. So that's actually great. Ooh. So the issue here is not that she responded. The issue is the way a community manager spoke to a potential customer. After this response, you just had another barrage of hate. People were upset with her attitude, the way she handled it. A lot of people said that they simply would not buy the game because of her comment. Now, this actually didn't backfire as badly as it could have, because as Abigail Pinehaven very nicely told me, the Steam wishlist actually went up by thousands. So this is a good sort of marketing situation. Someone made a bad comment, Rupert responded to that comment in a snippy way, and it didn't backfire. So in this case, it all went well. But unfortunately, this isn't the first time that Rupert has sort of poked the bear. Alice Rupert has been the community manager, or at least part of the development for three games now, Wildshade, Horse Sales, and now Kimori. For Wildshade, due to her need to shut down constructive criticism and police words, Wildshade's Discord server got shut down and shortly thereafter the game fizzled out and died. Horse Tales saw a similar thing, but other issues cropped up as well. Rupert went around calling it the best horse game in a lifetime and that this will raise the bar for all horse games, which it absolutely did not do because it was a broken mess upon launch and when people pointed it out, they were ignored or shot down. This means that anything that she currently says about Kumori has to be taken with a grain of salt because she has already 
said things that were not really true about Whore's Tales. And although I appreciate her supporting a game that she's a part of, don't smell your own farts too much. Another issue for Whore's Tales came after the game was released, released essentially broken. Players found out that the devs used not only storeboard assets, but free assets for a game that could go up to $50. And on the $50 versions of the game, you couldn't even save properly. People called the developers out on the assets, explaining that the visual issues more than likely won't get fixed specifically because they were storeboard assets. All of these issues were brought up in the bug reporting thread that had been on Steam and had been created and managed by a player and fan of the game. Rupert would ask the poster to edit this thread. They did so, but did not edit it sufficiently to Alice's taste and the thread was removed. This made people feel like they were once again being shot down and a few threads were made to explain how they felt. If you want to see more, I'll leave links and timestamps to these instances in the description below. Point is, Rupert is no stranger to controversy despite having extensive experience as a community manager. I want to make it clear, you can say what you want on the internet, freedom of speech is a thing. But if you are as Rupert representing a company and your name is associated with a the game, then you have to at least think about what you're saying. Not for your benefit, but for the company that you are working for. Silence can oftentimes be golden. Now, so far, this hasn't hurt Kimori. And I'm very happy for this because I think that it has a serious amount of potential to be a great horse game, to truly really catapult horse games into the mainstream market. Something I've been asking for for a long time. However, this tweet had the potential to do damage. I'm glad it didn't, because community managers really shouldn't be picking fights with players, nor should they be deleting threads, nor should they be shutting down criticism. The game is already a, in a tiny niche genre. We don't need more drama and hate to snuff it out completely.